All right, everyone. Well, welcome back to a very special edition of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. On the line with me today, I have Marty Appel. Marty, thank you so much for taking some time to join the show. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Yes. So Marty is a baseball author, historian. He has worked for the New York Yankees for what, Marty, probably 35, 35, 40 years or so? Well, I actually started with them in 1968. And uh, in my time as PR director and then television producer spanned about 20 years, a little more maybe. Uh, And then I've written some books about the Yankees, and today a lot of people look to me as a Yankee historian, which I'm proud to do. (laughs) Now, one of the funny things that I read about you when I was doing a a little bit of research, and I've known your name for a long time, and it's so great to be able to actually connect with you and have a conversation, but one of the things I found really funny, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this, was you... Like growing up in Brooklyn, uh, I don't know if you were supposed to be a Yankee fan. Is that accurate? (laughs) An accidental fan is what I was. Um, My first impression of baseball as a little seven-year-old was the Brooklyn Dodgers winning the 1955 World Series. And true to uh, the legend, people were literally dancing in the streets with joy. (laughs) It was their first world championship. Uh, To my little seven-year-old brain, I felt sorry for the losers, the Yankees, (laughs) and decided from that point on I was going to be a Yankee fan and root for the underdog. (laughs) So little did I know that they were hardly the underdog, but uh, I tell people sometimes that because of that, my whole life has been a mistake. I should have been a Dodgers fan. (laughs) <laughs> that is that is too funny the innocence of childhood and just not understanding that it took forever obviously for for the Brooklyn Dodgers to get that championship to get it against the Yankees no less was exactly. unbelievable that you know you're like oh I'm, I'm gonna root for the underdog and that's the Yankees and well I mean you, you picked a, a great organization obviously to to root for that was still a, a really amazing time in baseball for sure It was an amazing time in baseball. The Yankees won almost every year. It was an amazing thing. So it made you feel good about yourself if your team was winning every year and kind of reinforced your belief that, well, I picked the best. That makes me a better person, (laughs) which, of course, is not the case. But to a child, that mattered. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit then about how you ended up going from being a Yankee fan, as you just told us that story, to actually working for the Yankees. You mentioned you started there with the organization in 1968. What brought you to the organization? Well, there was kind of a fantasy. I mean, I never really imagined that normal people would get hired. I thought you you (laughs) needed to be related to somebody in the senior front office or something like that. But after my freshman year in college, I wrote a letter to Bob Fischel, the PR director, whose name I knew from the Yankee yearbooks, and I said I would love a summer job doing anything. And at the day that the letter arrived, he was sort of inundated and overwhelmed by unanswered fan mail that was going to address to Mickey Mantle. Um, Mickey was no longer taking the letters home at night and working on them. (laughs) And Bob knew that you couldn't look at all those letters and have all those fans be disappointed. So he talked upper management into hiring somebody to catch up with the fan mail, and that turned out to be me, which was a wonderful thing. He got my letter that day. Part of me had thought that He gets hundreds of letters looking for jobs. But actually, baseball wasn't very cool in the late 60s if you were a college student. Young fans' interests were going towards the NBA and the NFL. Not a lot of people wanted to work in baseball, so he didn't have a lot of letters. He had my letter. He called me in for an interview. That went very well, and I got hired to answer Mickey's fan mail. Uh, starting in 1968, which was Mickey's last season. Wow, that it's an amazing story, but it's also just an excellent reminder that I think a lot of us, whether we want to 
you know, maybe work for a dream organization. And you know, I don't know how long maybe you thought about working for the Yankees before you sent off that letter, but there, there at least was an interest. But I think a lot of us are like, oh, I, I'd never get hired by XYZ company or no, they wouldn't want me to work for them. But you took the initiative, you reached out and ended up getting hired. And, and sometimes it's literally that simple. And I think a lot of us make it a little bit more complicated when it comes to opportunities. I mean, it's the reason I'm talking to you today as well. I was just come across your uh, Twitter profile. I found your contact information. I reached out and we're having a conversation. And had I not reached out, this wouldn't be happening. So I think it's a really good reminder to everybody as simple as that can be, or as difficult in some cases, just reach out, be proactive. And I mean, look where that's propelled you uh, in your life. Just that, that one letter. <laughs> exactly. It all began with that letter. And uh, I tell people all the time, write the letter <laughs> or whatever form of communication works these days. But um, it wasn't like a lifelong dream. It was just one day I just said, boy, it'd be cool to work for the Yankees. I think I'll write them a letter. And it was just like that. <laughs> so as far as the work that you ended up doing with the organization before you, it was George Steinbrenner who hired you to be the PR director in 1973, correct? Yeah. Now, when I first got hired, CBS owned the Yankees. Right. And Michael Burke was the president of the team. And I was almost one of the senior employees by 1973 when George Steinbrenner and his group bought the team. So uh, it was a good thing for me because, you know, when you're, when you're the kid in the fan mail room, you're always going to be the kid in people's minds who were in senior management. Sure. To Lee McPhail and to Mike Burke, I was always going to be the kid in fan mail. When George Steinbrenner inherited me, I was already then the assistant public relations director, so I was no longer just the kid. And then ultimately he promoted me to be the team's PR director when Bob Fischel left. So when Mr. Steinbrenner asked you to take on that responsibility, what went into you know, building not just a relationship with the boss, um, but what went into you know maybe rebranding the Yankees in a way that they hadn't been you know especially during those CBS years when the team really you know fell out of favor they they weren't winning as much and you know you see the stories all the time about George wanting to obviously change the on field product but from your perspective and in your world I mean what went into those conversations if you had any with Mr Steinbrenner or uh, was it just you know you using your knowledge and being able to to recreate something that was a little bit more modern and might speak to the fans of the early 1970s well, the good news was that he and I were on the same page in terms of appreciating the team's history and its legacy. Sometimes you'll get new management come in and they just want to focus on tomorrow or today sure. um, and kind of sweep aside the past because we're not sure the past really sells a lot of tickets. But he embraced it. I mean, when he bought the Yankees, he was buying Ruth Gehrig, DiMaggio, and Mantle along with the franchise itself. So uh, that was where my head always was. I wanted to connect with those great glory Yankee teams and Yankee dynasties of the past. So we were always on the same page when it came to that. He never discouraged me from playing on the team's great history, to which I was grateful. And always, I'll always be indebted to him for... I was only 24 years old when he made me PR director, so for him to take a chance on a 24-year-old was uh, a, a great thing, obviously, for me. Yeah, and to that, I mean, do you think that there was something as far as your work ethic goes or even just some examples of some of the things that you had done in the past that could really speak to Mr. Steinbrenner trusting you with that responsibility, not just because of your age and being so young, but because... You know, Mr. Steinbrenner was coming in from the outside, and it probably would have been just as easy for him to hire one of his buddies, right, and and say, "See you later, Marty." <laughs> that is very true, and there was an elder uh, statesman, sports publicist, uh, who he knew well from Cleveland, who had come with him to New York for the announcement of the purchase of the team and so forth. So I always thought. Oh, that guy is going <laughs> to be the PR director one day. 
But it didn't happen. He showed confidence in me. He liked that I was trained by Bob Fischel, who he and everyone in baseball respected a lot. Uh, what he didn't know was the culture of the game, that PR guys generally were older guys who had been newspaper men and had followed the team for decades and been on the scene. Um, so I was the first of my generation to be named a team PR director, and it was, of all things, the New York Yankees and the biggest media market in the world. Yeah, that's so cool. Now, if you can tell us a little bit about you know, maybe some of the initiatives and different things that you did during your five, six years as a director, you know, I, I think about Jason Zillow, the current um, director of a PR for the organization, and like him instituting Hope Week and just so many different things that he's done over the course of his tenure. What were some of those you know, maybe big initiatives that you got done during your time that you can look back and still be very proud of and, and might even still be things that the organization does? Well, Jason's uh, creation of Hope Week was, you know, one of the best things I ever read about a, uh, a team PR director doing. So that was fabulous for him. I didn't have anything quite as enormous. Uh, and mine was, remember the George Steinbrenner years, it was almost day-to-day -day reacting to <laughs> whatever was the, uh, the clubhouse chaos at the time, the Bronx Zoo years. Um, but I took a lot of pride in the Yankee publications, the yearbook, always being a blend of the old and the new. Our old-timers days, which I ran, were, I think, very well staged. Our relationship with old players and creating an alumni association was very went over very well. So um, our broadcasts, I think, were very much fun for the for listeners having phil rizzuto and bill white and frank messer in the booth was great for the team they sold the team well so we did a lot right except we didn't win a lot until right. 76 <laughs> yeah in in addition to that you come in well you had been with the organization since 1968 as you mentioned but when you take over as director in 1973 that ends up being the final season at the original Yankee Stadium. So I can imagine everything from obviously the regular season games to old timers day that that year had to be, you know, something that was just probably much more emotional than than most years knowing that the stadium was going to go under a renovation. So when when in terms of, you know, all of that happening, I mean, was that was that something that you um you know, had to consider in, in terms of your job and your responsibilities, or was it more like you said, uh, just kind of managing the day-to-day -day chaos of, of the Bronx Zoo, although I don't know at that point if it was quite, quite as chaotic as it would later get. <laughs> yeah, it later developed into greater enormity than it was at the time. Uh, 73 being the last year of the stadium really called for nostalgia. Uh, it was the first time we ever had Old Timers Day being an all-Yankee affair. Today, that's what they do every year. But back then, we always had uh, half the players be opposing players who had some degree of popularity in New York. So going all-Yankee in 73 for the Old Timers Day was a break from tradition. And uh, I wanted to take a team photo that day with all the guests one grand Yankee team photo, and we did get that done. So uh, little things like that always meant a lot to me. Uh, jumping ahead a little bit, in in 76 uh, was the first time that we ever had the four great Yankee catchers together, Bill Dickey, Yogi Berra, Elston Howard, and our reigning catcher, Thurman Munson. And we had never had them all together before because Yogi had been um, coaching and managing at the Mets and had never come back for an old timers day or anything. So here I knew, I knew we had to get a photo of Dickie Barra Howard and Munson. And I couldn't wait to get the photo shot. <laughs> and of all things, Munson turned out to be the difficult one because I had it all set up. I had the other three guys on the field standing with each other waiting for the photo. 
And like I told Thurman, we were, all right, we're going to do this at 1230. And at 1230, there's no Thurman. So I run frantically into the clubhouse, and he's still in his underwear watching cartoons on the TV in the player lounge. <laughs> or, in fairness, I think it was Abbott and Costello. I don't think it was cartoons. So anyway, it was Thurman. We get the picture I told you about. We got to do this. I can't keep those other three guys there all this time. <laughs> so we got it done. And years later, I went to his home after he died. And there's the picture of the four of them framed and hanging up on, on the wall. So I want to, <laughs> Thurman, you know what you put me through for that? <laughs> <laughs> so those are the little stories that are definitely behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. And what a cool photo. Is that the only time you were able to get all four of them together? Yes. Yeah, that's that's really unfortunate. Um, but awesome that, that obviously we, we got that one opportunity cause there's a lot of history <laughs> in that, in that one photo for sure. Right. Now, when you mentioned, I, I didn't know the fact that I knew that, um, pri- prior old timers days had had different teams, players, not just all Yankees like it is today. I didn't know that 73 was the first year. Was it, you have to maybe refresh my memory and you being the, the Yankee historian. What was the year that Mantle hit the homer off of Whitey? Was that 69? Um, I think it was 69. You know, my memory isn't as sharp as it once was, but I think it was his first uh, old timers day, which would have been 69. Yeah. Okay. So were you on hand for that event by any chance? Yeah, I was. Uh, I can't imagine what that was like. I list, I watched the video and it's obviously not a packed stadium, it, but it, it sounds like it is. Like when, when Mickey's falling off those pitches and, and then he hits the digger and it, it sounds like he just hit the game winning World Series home run from like 1964 or something like that. Like it's it's incredible. Yeah, you know, when you see old timers day photos, the stands are not always packed. Uh, oftentimes because only the people who care about the old timers portion come out early. Right. And usually then, you know, other fans will fill out the ballpark when it's time for the regular game. Uh, but the Mandel fans were still young and loud. <laughs> and <laughs> that's why uh, the Mandel home run got such a tremendous reaction that day. And good for Whitey Ford to know what the fans wanted. Yeah. <laughs> and not, not try and strike Mickey out. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, well, I'm sure he got him back at some point or another. There, the the two of them being as close as they were, <laughs> right? So, uh, in terms of uh, you know, I, I know from my research that you've written a number of books with former Yankees, but in terms of just some of the relationships that you were a- able to develop, either with Yankees of yesteryear before you had gotten to the organization, or uh, during your time with the team, what are some of the most special relationships, you know, things that you're just so proud of, uh, you know, being able to have relationships with these really special guys? Well, I'm really happy that I had a good friendship with Thurman. Um, we did his autobiography together in 77 after he had won the 76 MVP award. He didn't really want to do a book, but I convinced him to do it because, um, I told him if he didn't, somebody else would write a book about him. He wouldn't like it. He wouldn't make any money off it. <laughs> and, uh, this was a chance for him to get the facts right and tell his story. Sure. So with some reluctance, he agreed to do it, and it was well received. And then, oh my gosh, you know, we lost him in 79 to that tr- terrible air crash. And then 30 years later... Um, my editor at Doubleday said, the time is really right for a full-blown biography of Thurman because his story doesn't end with the plane crash. It's the aftermath and the loyalty of the fans who loved him that emerged then and continue to rise to this day. <clears throat> so... We did a full-blown biography, which is actually my only New York Times bestseller, and was very well received by Yankee fans and Munson fans, and 
I'm happy to say by younger fans who never even saw Thurman play, but came to appreciate his importance in Yankee history. Yeah, I think you just nailed it on the head, his importance to Yankee history. I'm one of those somewhat younger fans getting older as, as the years go by, but I never saw Thurman play. I wasn't born until 1989, but I definitely grew up understanding you know, why his locker was preserved in the locker room. My dad would talk about his leadership all the time, how important he was to the organization and obviously how tragic and sad it was when he passed away and just knowing that it was mainly because he just wanted to be by his family more. And, and that makes it even more heartbreaking. But, um, you know, I think one of the, the things that I want to segue to here is to go back to George Steinbrenner. And I, when I was writing my book, the single hardest thing to do was to write about Mr. Steinbrenner. It, it was just difficult in the sense that I wanted to be fair to who he was as a person and not try to paint him toward one extreme or the other. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that I'm, I found most interesting when I was doing my research was the story of the aftermath when Thurman crashed and, and passed away and how Mr. Steinbrenner basically took over everything that needed to be done from an organizational standpoint to, you know, make sure that we, that the Yankees had the memorial that the, the team could continue to play, but also get to the funeral, et cetera. Uh, but then he also helped out the Munson family uh, and, and was just there in a time where he truly needed to be a leader. And I, and I put in my book that that might've been like George at his, at his best self uh, when, you know, that, that really tragic time. And um, you know, I, I don't know that everyone has the capability to do that. And, and um, you know, Mr. Steinbrenner, I, I thought that was a really powerful story. So um, I would love if you could talk a, a little bit more about Mr. Steinbrenner and, and his leadership in a way that, you know, especially while you were working with him um, directly, but even when you were with the organization, you kind of saw that transformation happen, right? Well, you're right to say that might have been his finest hour. He really rose to the occasion. He was genuinely grieved by what had happened uh, from a personal standpoint. He loved Munson. Uh, they were both from Ohio. Thurman used to come up after batting practice just to talk business with Mr. Steinbrenner in, in George's office. And <laughs> Thurman would put his uh, feet up on Mr. Steinbrenner's, it wasn't a desk, <laughs> it was a table, and the clumps of clay from the field would come off on the table. And, oh, it used to annoy George <laughs> terribly. <laughs> But when Thurman died, George said, boy, I'm going to miss those days of him coming up and <laughs> knopping those clumps of clay on my table. <laughs> so that was actually a funny moment, but that's what he recalled, yeah. and it used to really annoy him. But they loved to talk business. Thurman loved to learn from him about business. Uh, one was an employer, one was an employee, so they were never going to be great buddies. But as best as that allows itself, they were. The Ohio connection really worked for them. Uh, George was from Cleveland. Thurman was from nearby Canton. So they connected in a lot of ways. Uh, Thurman is a great leader from the day he made the team as a rookie in 1970. The pitchers had immediate confidence that he could call the game properly because he was so smart. He learned the hitters so quickly. And he had a cockiness about him and a swagger that you want to see in a catcher because you like to see your catcher be a take-charge guy. So Mr. Steinbrenner recognized those characteristics and made Thurman the captain of the team starting in 1976. And in 76, Thurman wins the MVP award, and the Yankees win their first pennant in 12 years. And a lot of that was the connection and the synergy between the boss and the captain. Do you think that, in a, in a way, you know, the, the 1980s, the Yankees won more games than anyone in baseball, but they obviously fell short of expectations, made one World Series, appeared in one other playoff, 
there was no Thurman in the 1980s. You know, he passed away in 79 and you just telling me that story of, yeah, I think in a, in a lot of ways, even though it was a chaotic time in the Bronx zoo that we talked about earlier during the late seventies, having Thurman there stabilized things uh, and, and, and allowed George, I think maybe even to, to, to trust that on the field, it was all going to work out as long as Thurman was there. Do you think that, Without Thurman, maybe that's why things got as nutty as they did during the 80s that eventually led to Mr. Steinbrenner being suspended for the second time uh, during the 1990 season. I don't know if there's a direct connection with that and the suspension. And I don't think Thurman would have been the catcher in the 80s. He might have still been there at another position or as a DH. His knees were pretty much shot by the end of the 70s. Um, but his presence always would have meant a lot just as a captain and as a leader and as a guy that everybody looked up to. So, um, I don't see a direct connection between that and the suspension of Mr. Steinbrenner in 1990, but I do see his absence in one way or another having an impact, particularly in the early eighties. You decide to leave the organization. Well, you decide to um, resign from being the director of PR during the 77 season, correct? Yes. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about what went into that decision? <laughs> I, can, I can only imagine uh, just knowing the, the history of the Yankees and what was going on at, at that time. But what went into that decision and how did you end up transitioning from that position to doing the TV producing? Well, um, a lot came with the 76 pennant that I'd been there a long time, nine years, and um, winning that pennant was kind of a culmination to me. It was like mission accomplished. We've been there. We got to the top of the mountain. It wasn't quite the top. We didn't win the World Series, but to me it felt like I'd been there through the lean years and now enjoying a World Series. Sure. Um, I love the television industry, and of course I knew the people at New York Station WPIX because they they carried the Yankee games. So I knew them, they knew me, they had a need for a PR director, and it turned out the broadcast industry was much more substantial than the sports industry, which was, you know, like, sounds like of course <laughs> to people listening to this but to me i mean when i was with the yankees i was with one of the most famous brands in the world i was with like coca-cola and exxon um and wpix some people thought like well you know it's a little new york station that shows odd couple reruns but actually i loved my time there i spent 11 years at pix the broadcast industry was fascinating to me I was not only the executive producer of the Yankee telecast, but I was the PR director for everything that went on at the station, be it news or sales or programming or community relations. There's a hundred things that go on there that you have to learn about. And I did, and I felt like this industry is fascinating to me. I went to Washington many times just to... Uh, visit with FCC commissioners or staff. Uh, I remember Senator Al Gore visited with us one day when there was the issue of cable proliferating and taking games off free TV. So um, I love those years in some ways, even more than my Yankee years. They were just so fascinating. Yeah. And I mean, it's cool that you 
also got to you got to broaden your horizons significantly it seems um, but you also got an opportunity to stay somewhat close to the team and the organization that you in a lot of ways grew up with right so oh, absolutely yeah i became as executive producer i was responsible for hiring the announcers and hence Rizzuto, White, Messer, and then later on, Tom Seaver and Bobby Mercer. So uh, working with those guys, winning awards with those guys was a great time of my professional career. <laughs> Maybe you could share with us a behind-the-scenes story, especially of Phil Rizzuto, but is there uh, a time that just really stands out, like a funny moment that you're like, oh, this this was so amazing, like one of the greatest moments of my life? <laughs> I don't know about greatest moments of my life, but there were, it was always something with Rizzuto. He was <laughs> what fans saw on TV, just a beloved uncle who uh, was just fun to be with. So I'll tell you this little story, which popped into my head just now. Was, uh, we're in Boston. It's the uh, last series of the year. The season is over. So I organized a little lunch at the Hard Rock Cafe uh, with John Moore our director, and Rizzuto, and um, Tom Seaver, and George Grand, who was with the broadcast team then. So I feel pretty good about myself setting up this luncheon, and, you know, everybody knows where the address is and where to be, what time. No Rizzuto. He doesn't show up. <laughs> oh, boy. So I'm very disappointed, of course. And then at Fenway in the evening, I see him, and I go, Phil, where were you? We had this great lunch, such a wonderful time. <clears throat> and he said, this was the Hard Rock Cafe, remember? And so Phil says, oh, Cora, that's his wife. Cora would have killed me if she found out I went to one of those topless places. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Rizzuto. That was his innocence and his little boyness. And uh, we loved him for it. <laughs> wow, that is an amazing story. My dad's gonna love that when when he hears it. He loved <laughs> Phil Rizzuto, so oh wow, I'm so glad I asked that. <laughs> so, Marty, the Marty the Yankee fan. I want to try and go through an exercise here real quick. If we can remove your professional affiliation with the organization and then your time as a TV executive and producer. Was there ever a moment as Marty the fan when you said, hey, I don't know if this is going to work out anymore with Mr. Steinbrenner or you know, maybe not as uh, drastic as that or just say like, hey, I don't know when the next time this team's going to make the playoffs. You know, Once once that drought started to, to really take a turn toward the late 80s and the early 90s there. Well, on the first part of the question, if I ever had a moment where I said, I don't know if I can continue this. That was pretty much every other day. So <laughs> you, had, you had to just ride it out. Um, I never got fired, but I, he used to say to me, now I'm not going to put you out on the street over this one, but if it ever happens again, you're gone. <laughs> and uh, I guess he had a short memory because I'm sure it happened again. <laughs> um, as for being a fan and rooting for my team there, Although we didn't win, we didn't go to the World Series from 64 to 76. And people re don't remember those CBS years as very successful. There were a number of years where we were still in contention in late August when we had to start planning for playoffs and World Series. You couldn't wait till the last minute. So I remember... In those days, you did it yourself. I remember designing a World Series program in 72, in 73, 68 was a year we won like 93 games. So um, it was, it, there was a lot of activity going on that made me, made it feel like we're not so bad. We're pretty competitive. We might win this thing. Sure. So hope always sprung eternal, and we did have genuine pennant races at least until Labor Day in a number of those years. Now, what about 
after you left the organization? Again, maybe just from a, a fan perspective, did it ever seem like it was just getting too out of touch during the 80s? And I know I think it was 1990 where it was the, the worst record the team had had since one of those CBS years. Um, did you ever yeah, lose? Those, did, early, those years in the early 90s were rough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when they went from Bucky to Buck to Stump. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, a different manager every year and never really a solid lineup, an everyday lineup. Uh, those were rough years as a fan. But then things started to come together with um, Bernie Williams and Paul O'Neill and Wade Boggs and Jimmy Key, and you could sort of see the makings of what would become a dynasty. And as a fan, some of my great moments were sitting in the stands in the new stadium, the one that opened in 76, and that place had such energy, and, oh, that could rock when there was a big Yankee rally late in the game (laughs) or something. The new stadium today, I've still never felt that. Sure. But that old stadium, I, I, my son and I went to uh, San Diego World Series game in in ninety eight. Yep. And when Tino Martinez hit that grand slam that woke everybody up, <laughs> I don't remember ever having a more joyous moment at a ballpark than the few minutes that followed that when everybody was cheering and the cheering didn't stop. Yeah. That remains one of my great memories especially that i shared it with my son yeah that had to be an incredible moment i know for me as a fan that was one of the things that drew me to the yankees was i i remember the 96 uh when yeah 96 when girardi hit the triple in the world series in game six and how loud the stadium is and it gives me goosebumps still to listen to it and I remember the first time I, I went to the stadium was probably the year before that. And kind of like that Billy Crystal story where he talks about he was walking through the tunnel and then he sees Mantle hit that majestic homer and, and everything. I just remember the the like aura of the, the stadium, even as a I had to be six years old or something. And I still could feel it and understand it at such a young age. And it was just a, a really special place. I think I think you're right. I don't know. I've been to the new stadium a number of times. I was there when Jeter hit the walk-off single in his last game and it just doesn't feel the same. I don't know that it was supposed to feel the same, but I, I certainly miss those days at the old stadium. Yeah. I think we both understand what we're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Now a lot gets said and rightfully so about Gene Michael and then later Bob Watson before Brian Cashman and, and their handling of the organization from a player personnel standpoint and being able to develop, you know, like you had mentioned Bernie Williams and Jorge Posada, Derek Jeter, uh, Mariana Rivera, Andy Pettit, et cetera, in those early years leading up to the dynasty. I'm curious though, if you could give us a little bit more background into Mr. Steinbrenner and his evolution as a leader, because I believe he fundamentally changed when he returned from his suspension. Was he still the boss? Yes. Was he still in the news quite often? Yes. Did he have a more soft touch? I believe he did. Um, And I think it became easier to work with him than it had been prior, especially when you were working with him. What do you think went into all of that? Like if, if um, you were in George Steinbrenner's head and you said like, Hey, I may only have one more chance at this and <laughs> otherwise it would be kicked out for good. Like how do you think his leadership style changed in a way that allowed for the organization to be as successful as they were? I would say is coming to trust that Gene Michael was going to give him a championship team and do the right thing by the organization. Um, Gene was a very special baseball guy, and as good as his predecessors were, I don't think Mr. Steinbrenner ever had the total confidence that he came to have with Gene Michael. And if Gene Michael said, no, we shouldn't be trading all these guys, uh, he backed down and listened to him. And ultimately, it bore fruit, and it led to the dynasty that began in the mid-90s. As far as the the legacy of Mr. Steinbrenner, then, and you're a historian here, and you've written, as you mentioned, multiple books, and uh, including Pinstripe, em- 
pinstripe empire, excuse me, uh, the New York Yankees from before the babe to after the boss. And I'm sure there, um, that was a, a big focus of the book to, to try and get, I mean, what is the, the legacy that you remember Mr. Steinbrenner for or that you want other people to remem- remember him for? Putting his profits back into the team. Um, still kind of unique for the Yankees, I think, and he sets the tone. Yankees, well, the whole industry started to make really a lot of money uh, in his time, but he would put it back into signing big star ball players and creating fan amenities and making the stadium fabulous. Um, and not every other owner did it. They would pocket the profits or share them with their partners. He withheld them from the partners. I mean, they would get some payout, but not if he had taken all the profits he had made and shared it all around. So uh, that's the, the great legacy. He put the fans first, and he gave them a great product year after year, whether it paid off in the end with a world championship or not. They were always entertaining, always had big stars, and the stadium was a great place to visit. Little things. I remember being with him in Philadelphia at the All-Star Game in 76, and just walking around the stadium and seeing how it was done in Philadelphia and seeing trash cans were overflowing. And Boy, that was one thing. We got back home and he said, I want those trash cans emptied every two innings, you know. (laughs) <laughs> Don't the thing unsightly should be in Yankee Stadium. And then we played a mayor's trophy game at the Mets one year at Shea Stadium, and he noticed how all the uh, ushers and ticket takers were saying, um, good afternoon, welcome to Shea Stadium. And he said, oh, we don't do that, anything like that. We're a grumpy place. Change that around. Make everybody say good evening or good afternoon <laughs> to the arriving fans. So he always had the relationship with the fans in mind, whereas some owners were still just opening the gates and, uh, you know, what you see is what you get. And thank you for your money. I really love that. And I appreciate that answer. We're recording this podcast on January 14th. I almost said July, skipping ahead here a few months, January 14th. And we're in the midst of a very, very slow baseball off season that has especially Yankee fans complaining. DJ LeMay, he was still a free agent among you know other needs that the organization has to fill for the on-field product. But what I love about what you had just talked about is George's his mission to make the Yankees a first class organization. And I've heard secondhand accounts of people talking about this all the time. And you just talked about it as well. I think I was listening to Mike Harkey on CC Sabathia's podcast. When Harkey was the pitching coach for the diamondbacks, he had come from the Yankees. He was working with Girardi as the bullpen coach. Then he goes to the diamondbacks as the pitching coach comes back when Boone takes over as manager. And he said, literally everything you can think of is first class. He goes, everything from the plane that you travel on to the food, to the space that you have in the locker room. And that, I think to your point, all came from George. And I think that is so powerful that a man who has been dead now for, you know, over, over 10 years can still install that type of mentality, not just in the fans' minds, uh, but in the organization that they still want to uphold that. And I know a lot of that has to do with the family still being involved, obviously, but yeah, I think it would be really easy to, you know, fall back and, um, you know, not, not do it the way that George did because it's probably easier just to, you know, let, let the garbage can overflow. Right. <laughs> you well, know, it goes back to earlier ownership too. The Yankees sought to be first class, really going back to the Jacob Rupert years. Rupert was a vel- very wealthy, um, beer baron who owned, uh, Rupert and Knickerbocker beer in New York city and wanted everything to be first class for the Yankees. And, I remember stumbling on an, on a story which I put in Pinstripe Empire about how in the, those days, we're talking about like the 20s, teams would play a lot of doubleheaders and they'd wear the same uniforms in the second game, sweaty and dirty and ragtag looking. And Jacob Rupert said, no, no, no. He said to his clubhouse men, 
I want them in fresh new uniforms for the second game every time. And as obvious as that seems today, <laughs> uh, that was a big thing. <laughs> Teams didn't make that much money then. Right. And ordering extra sets of uniforms was a given. But he did that with the Yankees in the 20s, and the Yankees always looked sharp and always looked well-groomed and well-dressed going back to his era. So in a sense, it's also part of the DNA of the team. Yeah, it really, really is. Now, we're here again for those tuning in. Late, it's Marty Appel, baseball author and historian. He's authored books such as Pinstripe Empire, The New York Yankees, From Before the Babe to After the Boss. He was the Yankees director of public relations and also a TV executive and producer during the 1980s and 90s. Marty, before I let you go, this has been an amazing conversation. So first I want to say that and say thank you again for your time. But I want to ask if I can uh, have you look into your crystal ball here in the future for the Yankees organization. What do you think is the outlook over the course of the next couple of years here? Are you seeing good things? Do you like the way that uh, Hale Steinbrenner is running the team? What is your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, I haven't seen any dramatic change where suddenly they're going to be cheap with, uh, you know, signing good players or deliver a non-competitive, non-entertaining product for the fans. So it's impossible to predict who's going to win pennants and world championships in the coming years, but there's no indication that the Yankees are going to go cheap or reverse course on giving you a first-class performance and product every year. So are you still in the belief then, I I will just say that I believe that Hal Steinbrenner and Brian Cashman and company have done a really great job, especially since about 2016 or so when they had that sell-off during the trade deadline that year. I think they do a great job with the organization. There are a lot of Yankee fans who don't think that they do a good job, that they're not pouring money into the team especially their, their free agents. And, you know, I always try to have the luxury tax conversation with, with folks. Um, but it, it seems like you think that the Hal Steinbrenner and his crew are, are still doing an admirable job with the organization. Absolutely. Still with a focus on signing the best foreign talent, whether from the Caribbean or from Japan, um, going after great free agents, uh, when George Steinbrenner bought the team in 73, one of his partners was James Niederlander, a uh, major Broadway show producer. And Niederlander said to him, New York loves stars. you got to have stars. And he, the organization still follows that route today. Uh, they may have miscalculated with John Carlos Stanton, but the intent was good. Sure. The intent was to bring in one of the best players in baseball. And as long as that's their overriding philosophy, their fans are always going to get a great product. I absolutely agree there. Now, Marty, are you have any, uh, I know you're, uh, you mentioned to me that um, you're not active in the PR world anymore, but is there anything that you've got coming up maybe once COVID's over that you're looking forward to anything with your work that you want to tell us about? It's a little premature, but I would say watch for news about pinstripe empire in the coming weeks or months. That's all I have to say about that. (laughs) (laughs) I would encourage people who are on Facebook, uh, they might want to join my group uh, that I oversee, which is, called pinstripe empire and it's kind of all things yankees in that in that page so uh i think real yankee fans would enjoy uh joining the group pinstripe empire awesome i will link that to the show notes so it's super simple for people who are listening to that episode just click on that you can join the group get connected with marty marty if uh, anyone uh, wants to follow your work can you shout out your website for us here real quick it's a pell p r a p p e l p r dot com. All righty, and I will also put that in the show notes, Marty. Again, I really can't thank you enough. This is I was so nervous coming into this conversation. Anytime I get to talk to someone who had an affiliation with the Yankees in one way or another, it's quite a treat. And uh, you've definitely delivered. This has been an awesome, awesome conversation. Just thank you so much for your time today. 
Thanks for all the good questions and the helping recall good memories.